Okay, so Andrew, uh, please. Okay, thanks very much. Um, this uh, is work that uh, um, a joint work with uh, Robert Wenzel, and, and it kind of has a long history. It uh, maybe it was inspired by the Beatles song Long and Winding Road. So it dates back maybe 10 years to work I began with John Borwine. And at the time, John and I uh, got stuck on this, but I guess over the COVID years, we've decided, or well, Robert and I managed to find a way to get around the point that we were stuck on. So what it's based around is essentially we're trying to look at uh, sets which are really in uh, the space of, uh, of a Banach space X crossed with its dual. And uh, uh, part of the, uh, we, we couple the spaces by extending the duality a product in this way and the norm in this way. And just as a, a, in, in my notation here, I'm considering the strong linear functionals of the ones which are uh, represented by things in the dual and the weak starred things that are valuation functions from the primal. And um, one of the things we want to try and do here is look at uh, 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 closures of convex sets that are uh, embedded in these spaces. And part of the problem with trying to look at closures of these sets is that uh, if you just look in terms of topological notions, strong closures are characterized by sequences and, uh, and is, is a, a countable thing. And the weak star topology in general is uh, characterized by nets and filters. And really that they couldn't be two more extreme notions to try and mix. And uh, so just as a, a, some uh, a notational thing here, of course, we can always uh, look at uh, uh, the uh, there's a duality embedding here. Uh, so um, uh, we, uh, we can think of, uh, uh, this is characterizing evaluation functionals. And of course, we consider subspace as being reflexible or reflexive, if indeed this is a, is a uh, uh, we can identify essentially the, uh, the second dual with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the primal space itself. And in fact, if, I, if we take this embedding and embedding the, um, uh, the whole uh, uh, primal space into this dual space in this way, into the second dual, in fact, is what we'll be doing is looking at linear functionals on the, on the, on the dual space. Uh, this, this is in fact a subset, a complete subset of the second dual reflexive spaces. We can uh, isomorphically identify those things. If we don't have uh, reflexivity, then when we go and take joules, of course, the spaces can expand in size and can expand quite rapidly. So we know, of course, that uh, if we've got things that are non-reflexive, then indeed these spaces can be quite, quite a bit larger than, than what we begin with once we start sort of taking joules. And so um, um, uh, in a reflexive space, of course, these notions, these uh, uh, continuity notions tend to collapse if you think about this, I can think uh, if I can identify my primal with my second dual, and I look at a strong, uh, sorry, a weak star linear functional, uh, then because I can identify my uh, primals with my second dual elements, indeed, what we can do is identify this as being a strongly continuous functional. And because of that, if I'm looking at uh, closures of convex sets, because a convex set is really the intersection of all these hyperplanes that contain it, then because I can identify those uh, continuous linear functionals in a reflexive space, it's well known that the, um, uh, that, um, the, uh, the weak star closure of a convex set is the same as the weak closure and is also the same as a strong closure because I, I get the weak, the weak star linear functionals coinciding with the strong ones. And so I get these uh, notions of closure collapsing, which makes uh, the uh, treatment of, co of convex sets and reflexive spaces somewhat uh, uh, simple. But of course, uh, the, uh, what we're actually often uh, wondering about when we're looking at these cross product spaces is the behavior of this, uh, this duality product. And it's well known that the, even though uh, the, we have certain continuities with respect to those components individually, if I try and look at the joint uh, uh, behavior of that duality product, then it's not continuous with respect to any kind of reasonable topology I have in general. And so, uh, and so what that does is can complicate uh, the study of things like monotone operators quite considerably. And so, um, and, and so uh, what uh, we're going to be trying to discussing here is whether when I'm dealing with convex sets which are contained in the cross product space of X cross X star, uh, can I try and look at uh, the closure of convex sets in these uh, product spaces in some way which makes them sort of amenable to some sort of analysis, despite the fact that we, uh, we um, uh, we may be dealing with uh, uh, convex sets, which are, are um, 
are contained in in uh, in the uh, in um, in sets which might be defined by the duality product. And this is what happens when we talk about representative functions uh, for monotone operators. So let's just uh, continue on talking about some standard things that are known. We know, say, that in LP spaces, we can always define a, a sequence of which grow in size. This is a, is a counter example of the difference between these kind of convergences in, uh, in a dual space. And uh, we can, uh, these, uh, this sequence is unbounded. In fact, we can adjoin to the uh, uh, to the sequence the uh, zero element, and of course we can uh, find that um, uh, this set here, uh, this should be A. This set here A is in fact uh, weak star closed because indeed we can show that the uh, sequence uh, uh, has an accumulation point in the weak star topology, which is zero. And if we look at the so-called bounded weak star uh, 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 closure. That's actually formed by the semi-norms associated with taking uh, supremums over compact sets in the primal space and looking at uh, these kind of uh, semi-norms uh, in the, uh, in the uh, dual space. And, uh, and it's a well, well known, in fact, with A is convex that we do get these things that coinciding. This is not a convex set and we can see that that losing convexity, we don't get those closures coinciding. And certainly these two guys are not equal to each other. The second guy is just the kind of rather naive thing of just taking limits of bounded nets. Okay, so we'll come back to this, uh, these ideas. So as I've mentioned before, is that when I have reflexivity, then uh, we know that indeed uh, uh, the, weak, uh, the weak closure is the same as the strong closure. And in fact, if I'm looking at uh, LP with P being bounded between zero infinity, then if I took the convex hull of the sequence of, uh, of elements that we had here, then indeed what I'm going to expect is that uh, its, uh, its uh, weak closure will be the same as its strong closure. And so therefore there has to be a sequence of convex combinations, which must actually converge to zero. So convexity is going to help me find things from a sequential point of view that tends towards these accumulation points that I have if, I, if I've got convexity. Now, uh, in, if I took uh, Q being plus infinity, which means I'm in the non-reflexive dual of L1, then normally wouldn't, speak, uh, wouldn't expect the weak star equal to the weak topology and therefore wouldn't expect uh, there to be a, a sequence. But um, it turns out that uh, in this particular example, and I, and I certainly don't think this is indicative, but I will talk about some non-reflexive spaces where phenomena like this do occur, where in fact I'll, I can take, a, I can take a, a set and I can take its a convex hull. In fact, what I'm going to be doing here is trying to take some sort of convex hull of the elements I have. And what, I'm, what I want to do is choose those, uh, uh, those um, uh, 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 convex combinations such a way that I can define a sequence where in fact, I'm going to find the sequence is going to converge sequentially. It turns out you can actually pull this off particular, this particular counterexample. I actually think that there is a counterexample where this doesn't work in this case, uh, but uh, it'd be nice for somebody to come along and, uh, and demonstrate one that uh, does that. But um, what I'm going to be doing today is talking a bit about the so-called bernard dijonet theorem. Continue. Uh, okay, so the uh, uh, bernard dijonet theorem talks about convex sets in the uh, weak star topology, and it characterizes whether you've got a, uh, a weak star closed convex set D by basically just looking at the bounded portions. So you intersect with a ball and you ask, is that closed for every ball that you can draw? Now, um, if I uh, define this particular operation, B of C, where you take the union of all these things, then in fact, what I'm going to get then is going to be something which is really um, um, derived from these bounded portions. And I'll call this the bounded weak star closure. <clears throat> it's just indeed the collection of all bounded, uh, bounded uh, uh, convergent nets uh, that uh, I can take from the set C. Okay, so um, uh, what, what one can show using the bernard dijonet theorem is a sequence of equivalences is that uh, we know that uh, C, if C is convex, and so we're out of the regime where I can uh, easily generate counterexamples, I know that uh, the so-called bounded weak star closure is the same as the weak star closure for a convex set. That's known because uh, uh, from, uh, from basic results and, and functional analysis. And, uh, and uh, I can, uh, the Bernard-Dijonet theorem is actually the three implies two particular step here. 
is the Bernard Dijonet theorem. And I claim all four of these guys are actually equivalent to each other. And in fact, um, uh, you can think of the Bernard Dijonet theorem as kind of a test for weak star closure as being the sort of fixed point property of this operator B. And that's really a property from the Bernard Dijonet theorem. Now that doesn't mean that I can characterize the closure of a convex set by taking all bounded weak star convergent nets. Indeed, that's not the case. Uh, uh, but really, this is just a test for weak star closure. So, so what has this got to do with uh, uh, monotone operators? Well, it comes back to representative functions. Representative functions are, uh, are functions which are bounded below by the duality product. And I can generate monotone sets by looking to see where these convex functions make contact with the duality product. So a monotone operator is an operator which has this particular uh, property. This is the so-called mon uh, monotone uh, uh, relation, which defines uh, these points being monotonically related to each other. And what I'm gonna talk right now is how these closures sort of come in when you try and look at the way we represent monotone uh, operators in terms of these uh, representative functions. If I look at the conjugate transpose of a, of a function uh, and, and look at it uh, in, uh, in a symmetric way where I wanna map from, uh, from the space X cross X star into the same space of functions, then the kind of conjugation I've got to use has to use these particular linear functionals. And these linear functionals actually are actually a strong cross weak star continuous. Okay, so if I, if I use the sort of usual conjugation where I'm gonna pair this space with its usual dual with a strong topology here and the weak, weak topology there, indeed what space I'm going to be getting my functions in is gonna be one which is going to be dualized sort of an order higher. Now, why am I, how are these uh, related? Well, the ones which are actually, the usual duality which is paired between uh, the strong and the weak and the weak star topology here, the sort of one that goes up, if I restrict it back down into my original space, I'll get this uh, conjugate dual we're talking about. So this restriction property is how you can kind of relate them in a naive way. And, and, uh, and indeed, when it comes to the study of representative functions, uh, this is indeed the kind of operation we use to generate representative functions. If I take a function, which is really the duality product plus the indicator of the graph of a monotone operator, and then I take this conjugate dual, uh, what, I, what I'm going to get of this particular function, I'll get the so-called Fitzpatrick function. So it's a member of this class of, uh, of convex functions, which has this kind of closure of its, of its graph. If I take its conjugate again in that way, I'll get the, uh, they get the largest representatives of this particular class. And just for future uh, 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 reference, I'll notice that if I look at the lower level set of the Fitzpatrick function with respect to the duality product. Now, I, I, um, I'm kind of looking for things which fall on or below. And this may be the case if the function, if the a monotone operator is not maximal. I know if the, if the operator is maximal, then the Fitzpatrick function is representative. It'll always be bounded below by the duality product. But if it's not maximal, then it may fall below. And if I, if I look at everything that falls on or below, I just get the set of everything that's monotonically related to the graph of the original monotone operator. So I expand it into collect up all monotonic related points. Now here's a little picture of uh, Regina and uh, Fitzpatrick uh, from, uh, from uh, earlier times. And uh, just as a word of warning with, with all this is that the restriction property that we, we apply is critical to get the re representativity property. There's a, a, a counter example of the Grossman uh, operator. It's a linear uh, monotone operator. It's skew symmetric, so it has uh, this property. And we can explicitly work out what the Fitzpatrick function is. It's just the indicator of its uh, graph. And we can take a particular element in its second dual. This is where I'm, I'm, I'm now going to uh, look at uh, at uh, it in its its uh, dualized to its higher level. So now I'm dualizing into the space x star cross x star star. I'm not doing the restriction here yet. And if I take the so-called, uh, I can take this element here and I can apply to it the linear functional, which is the Banach limit. Banach limit is an element of this dual here, which extends the idea of a taking a limit of a sequence. It in fact winds up being a linear mapping that maps between the limb sub and the limb imp. You can get that by using the Hahn-Banach theorem. And when you actually apply that element to the 
uh, plug it into the jewel of, uh, of this Fitzpatrick function. So you put it up into this higher space and you look at the duality product, you actually find that indeed you don't get it minorized. And so uh, we know that if, if we restrict, in fact, that would not happen. And so, uh, so this restriction property is quite critical in, in developing these particular uh, representativity properties. And in fact, if you use uh, the transport formula, which Regina talked about uh, in uh, some of the uh, discussions before, is that if you took this particular uh, uh, function and you just took its convex hull of its epigraph, it actually winds up being contained in the epigraph of the duality product. And what goes wrong here is when we take a kind of embedding, when we do this conjugation, we're kind of taking a closure and it's this closure that winds up destroying this, this uh, containment. So we wind up, when we go and take this weak star uh, closure, we wind up producing something as a convex set, which is much larger than this set here. But when we do this embedding, we get this particular closure and that, that preserves, in fact, the containment in that particular, uh, uh, this particular set here. Now, you can actually prove this uh, quite in a, quite an elementary way if you know something about, uh, about how uh, monotone oper operators are, uh, are developed. In fact, if we, uh, if we took a maximal monotone operator, the Fitzpatrick function is always going to be a maximal extension of S. It's always going to be uh, lying below. And, uh, and this convex hull here, is always going to be minorized by the second conjugate of that particular guy, which because it, I'm taking it with respect to this, this particular uh, con, uh, um, uh, tran transposed conjugate is equal to its second jewel. And if I take the supreme of all these guys, in fact, I know that I'm going to get that minorized below the duality product because that corresponds to the Fitzpatrick function of, its, uh, of, the, uh, of all the monotonic related points. So, so we're just going to discuss for a little while, and I'll, I'll see how far I get with this, the so-called bigger, bigger conjugate representative functions. The other ones, when I, if I take this uh, uh, conjugate transpose, I get a bigger representative function. And so in a sense, they, uh, they, don't, uh, um, they wind up uh, preserving this minorization you know, by virtue of the way in which the conjugation works. And it, and it turns out, in fact, that it was being proved recently by Robert and I that uh, bigger conjugate representative functions are monotonically closed. If I take the convex, uh, the monotonic related points of the monotonic related points, I just get the original monotone operator back again. And so uh, just as a, 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 uh, some examples of what, uh, what we can get by looking at these closures is that um, if I look at bigger, con if I look at a, uh, uh, a point, in the uh, uh, or, uh, related to all the monotonic related points, and I, I can I can take the uh, I know that the original monotone operator is contained in this enlarged set in general, and I take the closure respect to that with respect to this strong times bounded weak star. So these are all the strong weak star convergent bounded nets that remains within this set, particular set here. And if I have the bigger conjugate representative functions, it turns out that these guys are actually identical to each other. And so if I, if I marry that with the result known by uh, some work by Fitzpatrick, in fact, the representatives of the monotone set represented by the dual of a representative function winds up being exactly equal to all of these. And so it's in this sense that I believe that these monotone operators have a certain closure. Now, if I was in finite dimensions or reflective space, we would be saying, we would be claiming something to do with strong cock cross weak closure uh, but in non-reflexive context, this seems to be the, the way, to, way to go about it. And in fact, if I take a bigger conjugate representative function and I close it with respect to this closure, it turns out that in fact, if I take a look at the monotone set that's represented by that closure of that convex function, it winds up being equal to these guys as well. And so, and so this seems a natural kind of closure to talk about when talking about representative functions. So, so um, what I'd like to do now is to try and look at a way of, uh, of studying the, these kind of closures. And what I'd like to do is understand more about what uh, the relationship is between this kind of closure here, which is really just collecting up all of the uh, strongly weak star convergent bounded nets for, for a convex set and trying to see how it might relate to the usual closure that we have. And uh, so, um, uh, 
what I'm going to do now is try and look at this embedding uh, notion. So if I have a convex set that's in X cross X star, and then I, I embed it in its jewel, uh, in its second jewel, right? Then the second jewel will be of this form. And of course, I'll have three jewel, uh, uh, three stars here. And what I'm going to do to try and get it back into this space is restrict this embedding into its second jewel by restricting it by intersection, intersecting it with X star, star cross X star. Okay, now what I'm going to do now is therefore I'm going to be considering uh, really a space Y, which is X star cross X. I'm going to consider its dual as being X star star cross X star. And so I'm going to think about this space as having a weak star topology on it. And what I'm going to try and do is try and think about when I go on through doing this embedding process. So I've taken a convex set here in X cross X star and I'll put it inside this space here. And this space here is this space which has a natural weak star topology on it. And what I'm going to try and do is relate this weak star topology to the strong weak star closures of the original set. So, so I'm, I'm going to build this up in this way. And this is the kind of main observation one can do to make this connection, is that if I take a convex set and I do this embedding, Okay, and I'm embedding this, this guy up into uh, this space here. And this space here, of course, has got an on, on this natural weak star topology, uh, which is associated with this, uh, with, with taking the jewel of the space Y, right? So we're dualizing into this particular uh, uh, space here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk the, talk of, uh, call the weak star closure of that convex set with respect to that topology on this space. And I'm gonna ask whether, uh, whether those closures having a non-empty intersection has got something to do with separation with respect to linear functionals, which are with respect to the strong weak star closure uh, con with continuity with respect to the original space that I began in, X cross X star. And it turns out that these things are related to each other. In fact, the, really the kind of the, 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 the connection can be viewed this way is that when I take the weak star closure of these guys, which are put into uh, this space, and then I restrict it back down to the space I want it to be, it winds up coinciding with, with the closure that I want to study in the original space. And so this relates a weak star closure uh, of, uh, of convex embedded sets in the sort of hyperspace to the uh, strong weak star closure of convex sets in the original space. And the, the, uh, the reason why this is a, is a Interesting is because it allows me to, to uh, extend the Bernard G. Jeanette theorem, right? So I can talk about uh, closeness of C by trying to investigate the closeness of that set in this hyperspace. Now, the Bernard D. Jeanette theorem uh, uh, talks about, um, uh, tr talks about weak star closed convex sets. And what I want to do is extend it to convex sets that are in uh, this kind of product space. And I want to say exactly the same things that I'm talking about when it came to the weak star closure of convex sets in a, in a conjugate space. And here I've set, stated exactly the same things that were consequences of the bernard Jeanette theorem. And I'm saying this is a variant bernard Jeanette theorem. And I can kind of get this from, uh, from this idea because I can apply the bernard Jeanette theorem in, a, uh, in this hyperspace. By applying the bernard Jeanette theorem to these embeddings, if you like, of these convex sets in this hyperspace, which I can view as being in a dual space for the weak star topology. And then I can get back the original set by taking these embeddings by restricting back down. If I imply the, apply the bernard Dijonet theorem in the dual space, then I'm hoping to get something about it in these primal sets down here when I restrict back down. And indeed, that's, that's the whole idea with trying to extend this particular result. So, um, now, now I've, I've got a few minutes, I think, haven't I, uh, Julian, just to try and maybe get to a punchline. Yes, you do. Yeah, um, it, it isn't, does, this doesn't quite get us to where we want to get to because, uh, because I really would like to characterize the convex closure in the, in the sense, and really these results are about identifying whether a convex set has this closure. And they're different things. And if I wanted to try and uh, look at just collecting up all of the, convergent bounded weak star uh, nets. And I could do that kind of 
repetitively. I could do it infinitely often on a set. And I still wouldn't, I still wouldn't collect enough accumulation points to characterize this particular weak star closure if the set itself C didn't begin being closed in that sense. And this is really related to the fact that we don't really have a diagonalization argument for nets. I can take a limit of a net of, of, of nets and not diagonalize. There's no diagonalization argument. And so really what I would like to have is a sequential form to make this really more functional when it comes to characterizing closure rather than rather as being, if you like, a, 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 um, a, a certificate for closure, which is what the theorem really is, is a certificate for closure. And so really this is John Borwine's insight that he had many years ago is that if we had a version of the banach Dijonet theorem that sat in this form, is that we could utilize this result that talks about spaces which don't contain a copy of L1. And if the space doesn't contain a copy of L1, then, the, uh, then every, uh, for every bounded uh, subset, it's weak star, it's weak star sequentially dense in its weak star closure. And this kind of allows you to kind of take a step from weak star closures to sequentialness. So if we do that, if we use this result, we can get a kind of sequential version where if we assume these things, and I look at a convex set in, in, uh, and, and indeed to, to apply these things, I've got to be working in a space where essentially my, uh, I'm really looking at, uh, uh, you know, X star cross X star star. So they've got to be in a dual space to begin with. Uh, then I can characterize this closure of a convex set to be of a sequential form, really being the, uh, the, the smallest uh, sequential uh, strong weak star uh, uh, closure, uh, uh, which contains that set. So I can take the convex hull by taking all convex sets, which are, uh, 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 and then taking the sequential weak star closure and taking its smallest. And so that allows me to get a kind of sequential characterization uh, in these spaces. And uh, there are some other results which uh, uh, continue, but I can now say that if we have this VDP property in this sort of weak sequential form, then indeed what we can do is we can uh, start off with one of these representative functions and we can most certainly uh, convince ourselves that taking these closures doesn't destroy representativity. And in fact, um, I, can take, I could take any representative function and do this closure and we don't uh, violate this particular minorization by the duality product. And this is despite the fact this duality product has no joint continuity with respect to these convergences. And so this is what makes this verification quite difficult uh, to do, because I know that if I'm looking at uh, this particular uh, mapping, that this is not continuous in any of the topologies I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. There are many more things I could talk about. Uh, there are other operators that one can talk about when you're talking, talking about non-reflexive spaces. There are things called depth type and uh, of type NI and so on. And there's another story that goes along with this is that you can actually relate many of those properties to these kind of uh, uh, the uh, uh, to this kind of convergence. And um, uh, and if I had more time, I could tell you a story about how indeed uh, you can you can codify some of the results about these operators actually in terms of uh, inequalities between representative functions where you take certain kind of closures. And this, this can be a way of codifying those relationships. And so I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, thanks very much.